This is our reading from Luke 22. Jesus is arrested. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers in the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion? that you have come with swords and clubs. Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. So, uh, my name's Dean. I I'm named after my dad, and that's all I have really of him. Him and my mum had split up um, through addiction, and in 95, I went into care and in and out of sort of different families. Um, don't really remember much. Um, but however, I was blessed. Um, um, and I went into a foster family. I was with them for 11 years. Um, but before that, me and my sister were separated. I, I had a family uh, for the first time ever, like a proper family. And the, the family itself was amazing. Like, they, they loved me holidays two or three times a year. I went to America, Tunisia, all over the place with them. Yeah, it was amazing um, and really did treat me like a, a, a person and not a belonging. But obviously, being young, um, I knew they weren't my real family. I just knew that you have that and I knew that I was, I was kind of like an unwanted child at the time. When I went to primary school there, um, I was bullied in primary school, um, again for being the unwanted child. So that just reinforced the thoughts that I already had. Um, I was unaccepted there. Um, and plus they already had friends and a community on the go. So internally, the, the family, I was accepted, I felt belonged, but then on the outside, I didn't have any friends. Um, so it was always really, really difficult um, to, to sort of try and fit in. And I, I developed a people pleasing very quickly, do anything just for a laugh, and that got me into a lot of trouble. Um, so that was okay. Like primary school was a wee bit difficult, but then it got worse in high school. And there was one specific event, um, um, there was about four or five of them, and two of them held me down and they took it in shots, each hit me in the groin. And the people just sat and watched, the people I thought were my friends were, were just sitting there watching, like not doing nothing about it. I remember it starting to rain and I just remember when the school bell went, everyone just disappeared and left me in the corner. And when I went into the, the to school, I got, I got punished for being late for class. And then when I tried to explain what was going on, um, they put me into the guidance teacher's office and I told them what had happened and there was a meeting and one of the statements that, that stuck in my head as well was what are you doing to cause this? Um, so at that point I was like right so I can't do anything right um, I've got no friends, I'm unloved um, and I don't fit in so that was horrendous but anyway that didn't last so obviously I left high school um, and I went to college um, and it was a chance to be someone new, to actually try and be me for the first time. And fitted in, started drinking, having a party on the weekends, going out camping, usual stuff, actually starting to live a kind of normal, wild lifestyle like, that you would for that age. Um, and it was fun. Um, and I remember uh, one weekend, um, I went home and I had a bit of drink in me. And my foster mum was anti-drink, anti-drugs. Um, and I remember her just pointing the finger at me saying, you're on drugs and something happened inside me. I woke him up and I got very angry very quickly. I said, how dare you point the finger at me after all I've been through, um, yada yada, as, a, as an excuse. Threatened to kill myself if they didn't get me out. She says, you need to let me out here, I'm going to do myself in. Um, really naive and really stupid. Um, I should have just went to my room and went to sleep uh, and got up the next morning. But then nonetheless, um, my respite carer picked us up, but there was a, a, a key thing there. Um, my foster dad had never, I'd never heard this word till that night um, and I didn't hear it for a long time after but he was like, listen son, go away to respite, I'll speak to Anne, everything will be okay, I'll see you on Monday. I'd never heard the word son before um, and that kind of reassured me but a week later um, 
I went to a children's panel and I'd found out that both of them had been struck off from fostering. They'd been fired. Um, and I was told I wasn't allowed to go back and I, I seen that man cry. Uh, and it broke my heart and I knew that it was me that caused that. Uh, and I can't face to speak to them now because I know what I've done to their lives. So I carried that for a while. Um, I moved to Dunfermline um, through through care. Um, that didn't last very long, that lasted about three, four months. Uh, but my drinking had started to kick in. Um, I met a guy called Liam. Um, and he was like my best friend. We worked, trained, played, worked together. Um, shared the same house. We just lived life together. And we were just really good friends. Um, and that was just the lifestyle for a while, just partying in the town. Um, had a couple of girlfriends there, didn't last, kind of, that didn't work. Um, and then eventually there was a big argument um, in that house um, and I had to leave. And at that point, at the end of sort of 2008, beginning of 2009, I was homeless. Um, for the first time I had actually nowhere to go. So like, the school system had let me down in my eyes, the government had let me down in my eyes, social work had let me down, family had let me down, people had let me down. I couldn't trust anyone. So I was just then myself. And then since then, I just on a journey through through different cities, trying to find somewhere to fit in, somewhere to belong. Um, being arrested isn't any fun, man. Um, I think the last time I remember being arrested, um, I'd been out on a night out. Um, I would came home steaming. Um, I say home back to the hostels at the time. And um, I'd kind of been a bit aggressive towards the staff members even before, but I don't remember it. Um, and this was like the second time this had happened. So in the morning, the, the centre manager, the team leader, and one of the support staff had came up um, in the morning um, and says, listen, Dean, your room's being closed. Um, we think you're a threat to the staff um, and others in the building. I was like, well, this is silly o'clock in the morning. And I was like, just sort of coming to her, I was like, you can't do that to me. Um, and he says, give us the keys. I says, no. And next thing I know, there was two posts walked into the room. So I'd phoned the post before I could even have a chance to kick off. Like, the posts were already there. Um, and they've came in um, and they'd done a warrant check on me. And there was, I think it was seven or ten warrants out for my arrest. Um, all for not paying fines and stupid things. But nonetheless, I'd, I'd got um, arrested there and then. I got took down to Stuart Street Police Station. Um, and I got put in the cell, um, cold. Food's always horrible, like, it's not nice. Um, and I was in there overnight. Um, and they do a thing called wake-ups, so every sort of 10, 20 minutes to half an hour, and they come in and make sure you're okay. And they've got to wake you up for your own safety, so there was like no sleep that night. Um, early doors in the morning, I went to court. So I went to, my first hostel was Glen Rothes. Um, that was a fantastic wee place, really nice place, really good support, nice people. Um, and I met a girl there, um, Katie. Um, and she was like my, my first true love, like proper love, like, but I was selfish, I was, I was, I was nasty, I was just corrupted um, and so, I so selfish um, and I took, she, she asked me a question one day, she says, um, if it was me or drugs, what would you take? I said, drugs. I told her, I told her her face, I says, I would choose drugs over you, um, based on the fact that she says, you can't change a person and that's part of who I am right now, so you kind of have to accept that. That relationship broke down and it wrecked me. Um, so my auntie suggested that I register myself homeless again. So I made myself homeless in Glasgow for the first time. Ended up in the James Shields project. Was in there for a little bit. They got me my first ever house. Um, but again, not knowing how to manage money, not knowing how to, to pay bills. Um, I started getting red letters in. Um, council tax, all this sort of jargon going on. And I stuck my head in the sand. I was working in a bar, so I was running up tabs in the bar. I was getting a 60 pound wage because I'd spent the rest of my wages on drink um, and partying every night, so I couldn't pay bills. And then the stress hit and I kept drinking and drinking and drinking um, until I lost my job. And then three, four days after Christmas that year, uh, I got kicked out. I was asked to leave, um, so I left. 
I was homeless again on the streets this time. Um, I couldn't go back to my mum's because um, the, the relationship with her boyfriend. And, um, so I couldn't go back there. I couldn't go to any of my family. All my family's doors were turned down, so I was on the streets. Um, and that's when um, I, I started to come back to the mission. Um, and they sort of loved me back to life. They, they, they really did show me compassion. And I would disappear again, and I'd come back. And, yeah, anyway. Um, so this carried on for a little bit, on and off the streets, begging for money, sleeping in pee stains, sleeping bags. And, yeah, it's horrendous. Uh, spat on, laughed at, had money stolen off me, had my guitar stolen off me. Um, and eventually, I remember being in BHS, the Glasgow street pastors had walked past me. Um, and at this point, I'd known Alistair Duncan. Um, and he he stopped me and he says, I thought you were going away to rehab. I thought you were getting okay. I thought you were going to get yourself sorted. And I says, I'm not bad enough for rehab. A uh, pure idiot. <laughs> uh, he's like, this place is for people who want to know Jesus. Right, okay. Um, and he prayed for me and then went away again. And next thing I know, I'm linked up with the, the big Glasgow sleep out. Um, they were walking around. Um, my ESA sick line was about to run out, so I had to go to the doctors, which was down in Hunter Street. Um, and so happened that these guys were going down to Hunter Street as well that same day for the same thing. So they took me down, got my doctor's note signed, got my application signed, went away for an interview. 7th of February last year, I got sent away to, to rehab. Um, I spent 11 months there. Um, when I finished rehab, um, well, I, I got my phase four. Um, and the, the sort of three weeks prior leading up to that, I'd realised that because I'd been such a much of a banger on the programme that I couldn't stay there. Um, just still had a little bit too much street in me to, to stay in that, that environment. Um, and I couldn't get I couldn't get a council flat because I had so much debt to the council. Um, I couldn't get a private because I didn't have a deposit um, or anything. So and obviously going back into a hostel after rehab was bang out the question and definitely not going back on the streets. So a lot of prayer, a lot of hope and thankfully to to you and Clydesdale, um, David Harper, Alistair Duncan and Colin um, McPhail, they, um, they all worked together and found me a flat. Um, I moved out on the 26th of January, which was a Friday. That day I moved into my flat that I'm in now. Um, and it was fully furnished. There was heating, gas, electricity, money in my pocket, food in the fridge, um, and, and no worries. Um, and since then, um, I, I'm going to college in August. Um, I am a part-time paid staff member of the Glasgow City Mission. I work in the Olive Tree Cafe. I have friends that actually love me, um, and I have really good mentors around me, and I have a positive future. Uh, and yeah, I can't see any of this being possible without Jesus. Like, um, yeah, so that's amazing. <laughs> for me, for a long time, um, like I understood the cross, I understood Jesus, well, my interpretation of it anyway. Um, and I always felt very dirty coming up to the cross because I knew I was just going to sin again. Um, and I was only seeing half, half the gospel, I was only seeing half of the cross um, and half the message. Um, I, I seen the cross as a place of repentance um, and I had to continuously come back and I always felt really unclean coming to the cross and going, I deserve every punishment you've got on offer. But the other half of the, the cross is salvation. Whenever I would come down to the place of the mission or to the church, I would turn up drunk or battered or stinking and they would still show me that same love, they would still show that, 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 that same compassion, invite me in, dress me, clothe me, feed me and send me back out on the doors again and I, I would go back out and I'd make the same mistake again and I'd come back continuously. Um, and when we come to the cross, we do feel dirty, um, we do feel wrong, we do feel like we, we don't deserve it. Um, 
but God's hand and love still stretches out and goes, you know what, I don't care. Just because you don't deserve it doesn't mean you can't have it.